In this video, we're going to be taking a look at topic 8.5, eutrophication. Water is particularly susceptible to pollution. Like air, it moves around easily. Water moves underground and flows on Earth's surface. That means that any pollutants that are in the water move around just as easily. It's very difficult for us to therefore contain those pollutants because it's being transported over such great distances. That means, ultimately, that the pollutants have the ability to affect a much greater geographical area because of their mobility. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at how certain kinds of pollutants, namely nutrients, can have dire consequences. First, a few definitions. We measure the nutrient content of bodies of water and classify them based on that nutrient content. The first category is oligotrophic. An oligotrophic body of water, like a pond or a lake, is one that has relatively low nutrient content. Because of that low nutrient content, that also means that its primary productivity, or photosynthetic output, is also low. Now, each of these subsequent levels, like mesotrophic and eutrophic, essentially increases the amount of nutrients as we go up those levels. That also means that primary productivity, photosynthesis again, is increasing, and water quality is therefore decreasing. What we're going to be focusing on in this video is, of course, eutrophication. The amount of nutrients in a body of water can be increased under natural processes. Air and water are constantly moving around nutrients. When rivers flood, they can bring in new nutrients from upstream to downstream, and that would, of course, increase primary productivity. What this is going to focus on, however, are the most damaging effects of eutrophication, the ones caused by humans. We refer to this as cultural eutrophication because it's our actions and activities that are resulting in these increases in nutrient content. Industrial practices, uh, the discharge of waste, and especially agricultural runoff can lead to the increase of certain nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus finding their ways into bodies of water. It's those nutrients that are associated with the eutrophication process. We're going to watch a video from a Detroit area newscast that's going to look at the consequences of eutrophication in Lake Erie. The algae bloom that turned part of Lake Erie toxic just a few weeks ago is bringing a new level of tension to runoff and several other troubles in the Great Lakes. Yesterday, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency announced that it will provide $12 million to the region to help address those problems. Reporter Christy McDonald of Detroit Public Television has our story. Lake Erie has long been considered the canary in the coal mine for the Great Lakes system. The southernmost, warmest, and shallowest of the five lakes, Erie provides an ideal habitat for an unwelcome summer visitor, algae, particularly the toxic kind that caused drinking water problems for Toledo, Ohio, several weeks ago. And that makes it an ideal place to look for solutions to that problem. Here at the Stone Lab in Putin Bay, Ohio, they've been studying algal blooms since the 70s. At that time, significant improvements were made to sewage treatment plants, ushering in 30 years of improved health for Lake Erie. But in the early 2000s, large algal blooms started to reappear, with the worst on record occurring in 2011. For Jeff Reuter, director of the Ohio Sea Grant College and Stone Lab at The Ohio State University, that algae bloom was like nothing he'd seen before. The bloom in 2011 really got everybody's attention. That bloom was two and a half times worse than anything we'd ever seen before. And it, and it was really a bloom like I'd never experienced. And I've been working on Lake Erie since 71. And I've seen these before, but I'd never seen a bloom that when you hit it with a boat, it actually slowed you down. It was that dense. He believes that bloom and others like it are caused by excess potassium, nitrogen, and other byproducts of fertilizer runoff from the farms and towns that surround Lake Erie. And the algae are very much like the grass on our lawns. You know, you put fertilizer on it, it's gonna have nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. It's gonna make your grass grow. We put it in Lake Erie and we get algae. 
Reuters says those ingredients can be coming from a variety of sources. When we look at different places around the country where they're having harmful algal blooms, some of them are going to be driven by agricultural loading, but some of them are going to be poor sewage treatment plants or a bunch of failing septic tanks. But in Lake Erie, it's primarily agriculture. And climate change is proving to be an aggravating factor. Most of the phosphorus that comes into the lake, probably over 80% comes in during storms. Climate change leads to more frequent severe storms. And if we have most of the phosphorus coming in from agricultural runoff, combined sewer overflows, uh, runoff off our lawns, if most of that's coming in during storm events and you have more storm events, you're simply going to get more phosphorus. It's that simple. And more phosphorus encourages the growth of a form of algae known as cyanobacteria. It produces microcystin, the main toxin of concern on Lake Erie. And although Toledo's recent bloom was actually quite small, the densest portion of the harmful algae clustered right over the intake for the city's water treatment plant, turning the tap water toxic. But if we don't fix the problem, we're going to Justin Chaffin, research coordinator at the Stone Lab, tests samples from surrounding water treatment facilities to monitor whether the water is safe for drinking. If you look at some of your known toxin that you're familiar with, microcystin is about on par being, being toxicity with, with something like cyanide, or, and it's just below, just below dioxin. So it's a, it's a really potent toxin. The United States has no national standard for these toxins, but Ohio has adopted the standards of the World Health Organization, which recommends one part per billion for drinking water. On August 2nd, 2014, the toxin levels in Toledo's water came in at three parts per billion. Yet the most alarming aspect of that toxic bloom is that it arrived in early August. It was much earlier than we had anticipated seeing a really bad bloom. Scary for all of us because we know that this bloom is going to stay around here until well into October, maybe the end of October, and it probably won't reach its peak until September. So, you know, you, the big concerns are the worst is likely still yet to come. Chaffin has also been studying the toxic algae on a molecular level. His findings provide some clues into how we may be able to stop these blooms from spreading. During that summer of 2011, we did a molecular study where we tracked the, the cyanobacteria, the microcystis bloom, throughout the lake and throughout time. Now, that cyanobacteria bloom that started in Maumee Bay in uh, mid-July was the same microcystis that ended up off Cleveland in October. So with that molecular study, we know that if we stop a bloom in Maumee Bay, we'll stop a bloom by Cleveland or by Sandusky. So if we stop it in Maumee Bay, the rest of the lake should be good. Currently, the only way to stop a bloom from moving is to stop it from forming in the first place. And the only way to accomplish that is to reduce the amount of phosphorus coming into the lake. I don't think anybody thinks that we're going to make it colder real soon. So we can't address climate change to say, well, the solution's climate change, all we got to do is stop it. The only thing that we control is phosphorus load. And that means we have to change our behavior. Our goal has to be to reduce the phosphorus by about 40%, but that's not something that I think anybody believes is going to happen real quickly. So the first thing that we have to do is arm our water treatment plants with the right technology, the tools, make sure that the people understand, the people that manage the plants, understand how to take the toxins out that come into the plant, because clearly toxins will come in. We're now entering into prime algal bloom season. Some water treatment facilities are testing for the toxin, but those tests aren't mandatory. Municipalities can only look to scientific research from places like Stone Lab to understand algal blooms and to prepare for the possible threat to their water supply. As we saw in the video, eutrophication, or the introduction of excessive nutrients, has the potential to cause some pretty serious consequences, beginning with algal blooms. Those higher levels of nutrients allow for fast-growing organisms, like algae, to sequester those nutrients so fast that they're able to grow near or at their intrinsic growth rate. As those algae grow and photosynthesize, there is an increase in the amount of oxygen in the water, but there's also an increase in cloudiness or turbidity of the water. And as you can see, depending on the amount of nutrients available and the temperature of the water, algal blooms can be quite extensive. 
but the fate of those algae is already sealed because eventually as they consume all of the nutrients that are available to them they will die off now those dead algae are going to be consumed by decomposers microbial decomposers that are going to do so aerobically consuming both the algae and the oxygen that's in that water. The result of this aerobic decomposition is a hypoxic environment, an environment that is so low in oxygen content that larger organisms, which require relatively high levels of oxygen, simply cannot survive. Algal die-offs can lead to dead zones that are quite expansive. Not only can they be really large, but in some places where agricultural runoff is a regular process, these dead zones can also be cyclical in nature. If we take a look at the Mississippi River and the Mississippi River Basin, we know that the entire central portion of the United States is occupied by farms and agriculture. So any excess nutrients or fertilizer that are used in those areas are going to eventually find their way into the Gulf of Mexico, which would lead to a massive algal bloom, which will eventually die off, leading to a hypoxic environment and an environment where larger forms of life simply won't be able to live for a period of time. Just for perspective in this map here, you can see Houston on the left side, Louisiana's on the right. This map is just over 200 kilometers wide. That does it for this relatively short video. I hope you enjoyed watching. Until next time, take care.